I call tonight's uh, study session to order. Um, Mr. Z, would you lead us in the pledge, please? Hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. All right, um, I have a quick announcement. Okay, Welcome to our meeting tonight. Thank you for taking the time to join us. As of July 28th, the California Department of Public Health is recommending universal masking indoors statewide to prevent the spread of the COVID-19 Delta variant. It continues to be our practice that CNUSD will follow CDPH guidance. As such, we require face coverings be worn in all indoor settings, regardless of vaccination status. Face coverings should be worn properly, covering the mouth and nose, even when addressing the board during public comment. Your cooperation and adherence to this updated CDPH guidance is greatly appreciated. Persons who refuse to properly wear a face mask will be escorted out of the meeting. Thank you very much. So we move to public comments and another quick announcement. At this point in our agenda, we invite the public to address the board. Please limit remarks to three minutes or less. Comments will be timed. I remind the audience that this is a public session of the board and not a meeting of the public. Although the board will not respond to speakers directly, either during public comment or after the meeting, staff members may contact or follow up with the written communication. If multiple speakers address the same subject, I may request that subsequent speakers only add new information. The time limit for a given topic is 20 minutes. Regardless of the number of speakers, if a speaker wishes to be heard on more than three topics, the speaker will be allowed up to a total of 10 minutes to address all desired items. Persons who have complaints against employees of the district are encouraged to seek resolution of those comments by utilizing the district's written complaint procedures rather than orally addressing them at a meeting. Please refrain from applauding after each speaker. Public comment is now open. And a few of you have more than one card and so we tried to divide it into the order um, of topic, so I'll try and uh, tell you which which card is up. Okay, number one, uh, Mina Arnold. Good evening, board and cabinet. Last board meeting, I spoke about how it is imperative to plan and have conversations before we have to hastily make decisions. We know COVID numbers are going to increase. What are we doing, doing proactively to ensure school shutdowns are the very, very last thing to happen? Last year, our district was in a reactive mode all year long, making spur of the moment decisions and ultimately keeping our students from experiencing full-time school because we weren't prepared. We were promised that we would do better, that tables and benches would be purchased to allow our students more space during lunch. We were told that our insanely high class sizes, which ultimately kept our secondary students from returning full time last spring, is an area that the district was devoted to working on. If our district was truly devoted to reducing class size, shouldn't that be included in the strategic plan? Shouldn't how we spend our funding reflect where our priorities are? Last spring, we gave everyone and their mothers a substantial bonus. And by the way, you were given incorrect information. When you asked if that funding could be used to purchase equipment to get our students back to school, um, it was from the unrestricted general fund, which means it certainly could have been used for a number of things, including equipment. So here we are, the next school year, back in the same situation we were in last year, with overcrowded classrooms that pose health issues and limit the quality of learning that's occurring. So talk through this scenario with me for a second. Let's say numbers go up. Let's say the California Department of Public Health says we now need to social distance. Go back to the social distancing. We're now back in the same situation we were in before, where our secondary schools can't make the six foot or even the three foot distancing requirements. 
Once again, we will be back in the same situation where we're going to be watching districts around us able to remain open while CNUSD is forced to close because of our lack of preparation. Board meeting after board meeting, I sit here and listen to you all patting each other on the back. I listen to presentations on implementing uniforms in a school. I listen to presentations about the district attendance award that we received. I listen to all the sports accomplishments. And I'm not saying that those things are not important or worthy of recognition, but when the rubber hits the road, the big pieces that are critical to a successful education for our kids, like class size, are, bring, are being brushed to the wayside. I'm going to be submitting a records request, heads up Judy, wherever you are, asking for student to teacher ratios last year compared to this year. I understand that we did hire a few more science teachers at the secondary level, but my guess is that those ratios are not going to be much different. I would highly suggest every single one of you ask for that same information. We have to do better at making these critical pieces our priority and not allowing ourselves to get distracted by whatever the shiny, flashy thing is at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, Serena Smith. I have a district COVID exposure policy first. Is that okay? Okay. Hi, I'm Serena Smith. Um, yeah, I was just looking up the, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have everything written out. Um, I'm kind of getting used to being back in school, my kid being back in school, but district exposure policy. I've had friends talk to me and I am just furious. Why are our admins know the board policy? Why do we as parents have to fight to get them to follow your policy. It's crazy. I'm reading here, 10 days, and this is with an unvaccinated, no mask. Doesn't say anything about outside. 10 days with no test or seven days with a negative PCR test. So why are parents being refused? Why are admin acting like they don't know? And I'll get back to you. How many days do you think they should be allowed to get back to us? Because I get it. Maybe they don't know off the top of their head. But you're sending our kids home. I'm sorry, not you. The, the admin is sending our kids home 10 days with no in-person instruction. That's important to me. That's why I came and fought for our kids to be in class. If my kid is supposedly exposed and gets sent home, and I want to get a test because I value in-person education and they're refusing. They're acting like they don't know and not returning any contact with us. This is ridiculous. And another thing, what is your policy, I haven't found it, about outside exposure and about who you listen to? So a kid can say, oh, by the way, I walked by so-and-so and so-and-so and guess what? They're pulled and thrown out for 10 days. And I'm saying this because it's happened and it's happening right now. And when you say, can you please prove that? They say, sorry, the burden of proof is not on us. So now these kids, again, 10 days with no in-person instruction, which I don't think that even it fits the new um, AB 130 policy, but I value education. I value your teachers. I understand COVID is out there, and I know we need to do things to keep people protect, protected, but these admins should be following what you guys put out. So thank you. All right. Michelle Gravendike. All right. Good evening, guys. I'm Michelle Gravendike. I'm both a special education teacher as well as a parent in the district. In light of the new mandate announced this past week, a group of CNUSD employees have been building and binding together. Both certificated and classified, over 100 employees and growing have come together from at least 29 schools. In a very short period of time, we represent elementary schools, intermediate schools, academies, high schools, TSAs, service providers, and more. We are looking for the board and the district to defend this group of employees. We are calling for the district not to follow the mandate requiring employees to be vaccinated against COVID-19 
or tested if they aren't. We are against vaccination being required. We are against the testing requirement. However, if there is indeed going to be testing, that it will be one for all employees, regardless of vaccination status. It has been clear that people are contracting COVID regardless of vaccination status. Two, the district pays for the testing and not us employees. Three, that testing will be made convenient for us. Four, that the test is not up the nose, but rather a spit test or a cheek swab. We are calling for our medical information, such as vaccination status and testing results to be kept private. If we are named by someone who, is te who has tested positive as coming into contact with them, that we are able to confirm or deny being, um, rather than being immediately put on quarantine for 10 days. And we are calling that if we are put on quarantine due to contact with someone who tested positive, that we are given our full, day, our full daily pay rate, regardless of years of service. And now I'm going to address the employees of the district. If you are unvaccinated and feeling alone, you are not. There is a group of supportive employees actively working on solutions. You can reach us at the email choiceincnusd at gmail.com. The three words put together, choiceincnusd at gmail.com to get connected. Uh, once again, choiceincnusd at gmail.com. If you are a loved one, an employee like this, please share it with them. We would love to get connected and continue to support each other and work on coming up with solutions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Serena Smith. Hi, I just wanted to quickly, because um, I know there's a lot of speakers, but I just want to quickly say about, um, I know I'm, it's kind of reactionary about the vaccine mandate because we have testing right now, but I, I feel like we're always reactionary, so I want to kind of get ahead and say if you actually mandate the vaccine, um, the CDC actually reported that 28.4 of the black community have received the COVID vaccine. Everyone has had their chance. This is their choice. So when you guys just think about that and think about that when you're talking about equity, because that is now forcing them to do that. They've had their chance, they've had their choice, and they made their choice known. So if you push any kind of mandate in this district, just remember you gotta get stepped down off that equity box. Thank you. Okay, uh, Christy Creasy. This is uh, on the mandate, va uh, vaccine mandate. I wasn't planning on saying anything. Um, my name is Christy Creasy. I represent students in the district and parents. Um, I want to say I represent teachers too because without the teachers, my kids wouldn't be learning anything. I came here tonight not wanting to say anything because I've said something the last couple meetings. Um, I'm terrified of the idea of vaccines being mandated for the teachers um, because it's our children next. And um, I don't know how people can stand two years ago on, or now if they do on the box of my body, my choice, but they're still in the clinical trials of this vaccine. And I, I understand anybody and everybody who has wanted to get vaccinated has had the chance to do that. Um, I'm not a doctor. We'll try to get one here next week maybe. I mean, we have doctors in the room. The vaccine just terrifies me. We don't know the long-term effects. We don't even know the short-term effects other than horrific numbers that we're seeing. And to think that our teachers, who are the future and livelihood of the next generations across the board in this state are being qualified or, or required to get vaccines is like, what happens if that goes wrong? Like what, what, who teaches if half of your teachers die within three years because their immunity is shot? Like who's gonna teach our children? It terrifies me that long-term, the vaccines are just do it, just do it, just do it. Everybody should have a choice of what they're gonna put in their body if it's not done with the clinical trials. And um, 
we're off track. Um, I'm deciding I actually like the track system here in the district. Um, so I, I went to Napa the other weekend a after the last board meeting. I had a great weekend with my husband and then I, um, my dog died, which was sad. But then uh, we went to the river this last weekend. Um, I drove home today, my husband drove. It's better to be a passenger on that drive. And I just sat there looking at my children playing in the water and I realized I can't sit quiet on this. The, this is the future for all of us, for our own kids. And not to be offensive, but none of you guys look like you have school-age children. But a lot of us in here do, and that's why we're bothering showing up. But I just, um, I sat there and prayed for a second. And I was like, God, what, what is this? What do you want me to do? And yesterday was the 16th, and I tried to read a proverb a day, and I was way behind because I was on vacation. But Proverbs 16, 1 in the the Passion Translation says, go ahead and make all the plans you want, but it is the Lord who will ultimately direct your steps. We are all in love with our own opinions, convinced they're correct, but the Lord is in the midst of us, testing and probing our every motive. And I just ask you, what are your motives? What are your real motives? Why did you push to be the highest paid person in the room? You care about these kids, I think. I just want to put it out there. What are your motives? That's all. I'm out of time. Wendy Wilson. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Wendy Wilson. Um, I've spoken quite often with many of you um, over the last year and a half, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I've felt really lost the last year and a half. Um, I started out with luckily uh, finding a group of some educators and moms who are very like-minded and um, were concerned about the mental health from the very, very beginning. And we jumped on this and tried to get on it. And, and many of you were very receptive and have given a lot of your time to discussions and I appreciate that. But I look ahead now into the past and we are a year and a half where we're at and we really haven't made any progress. Um, most of the kids who failed last year went back to summer school, my son being one of them who failed two classes and was an A student. He got an A plus in one class and a B plus in the other. It was in person, it worked for him. Um, so he had to pay the price and he did it. Um, we have a lot of families suffering and struggling in our communities right now. Nothing has changed. People are going back to school and it's great. We're thrilled for that, but we still feel like we're begging and we're groveling. We see on the news that other districts have let go of that mandate from mass. It just happened yesterday in another district. So the question is now that it's not that it can't happen, it's that it won't happen. So my question is, and what I would like to know, and if someone can respond to me, let me know why one district can do it and we can't, because that means that it is doable. Okay, so I spent two summer boost programs with um, back to back this summer teaching kids and I'm back in the classroom, thank God, after a year of being forced to be a virtual teacher. Um, thank God I was in the, the lives of the kids who are in those virtual classes because I kept in contact with them very close and made sure that their year was as good as it could be. It wasn't that way for many, many kids. The Summer Boost program, we literally were on each other all the time on the playground. They're talking, they're touching, but the second we walked back in that classroom, those masks had to come on. They had to do yoga breathing exercises, which the class was fantastic, but they had to do these spitting exercises and breathing exercises in their masks. And so I asked you, do you think about these things before they are decided? Talk to a group of teachers, get the teachers that are coming to you all the time, put us on a committee, talk to us about things that can be done you're not really hearing all of the situations. The kids are sweaty, they're hot, they're not feeling well. We've got admin coming and saying, putting your mask on, because that's what they have to do, it's their job. I don't know if they like it or not, I hate it. My little kids, my 26, seven year olds every day, they don't feel good, their masks are on, they can't understand what I'm saying. It's not fair, you guys. It's not fair that these moms, and that I know in my community after living here for 26 years are amazing moms. They know what is best for their kids. Right now, if you force this mask and this vaccine mandate on us, you're gonna lose a lot of teachers. Me, most likely one of them. My husband, I don't know, I'm not sure. Okay, but me most likely one of them. I can't stand by and let you guys do this anymore. Please work with us. A hundred teachers and staff. Thank you. The time has expired.
Please listen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Lenting. Not sure if you guys missed me or not. It's been a while. But um, I've been here for the last year and a half fighting for the kids. I've, I even mentioned I know the va vaccine's coming, the mask mandates. Start with the vaccine mandates and with the kids. Um, I stand here today with the teachers against the vaccine mandates. I don't think it's right. It's emergency use authorization only. It's a 99.9% .9 survival rate unless you're 70 plus. 50 and 60 year olds it is if you have two or more, three or more comorbidities. Everyone else should be reaching herd immunity. Um, you also have the choice. If you don't want the, to play that gamble, you don't have to. But as it is, there is no such thing as zeroism. There will be no zero COVID. It's a mutating virus. You go ahead and you vaccinate for this, and then we get the Delta. And then it's going to be another strand and another strand. I've been listening to Dr. Malone, the creator of the mRNA technology. He states that the mass vaccination should never have been done. We should have we should have vaccinated the ones that are in trouble, the 70 plus, we should have made it an option and given them an informed consent. Because if you force it, it's not informed consent, it's just coercion. And then for the younger people, you give them the information. I'm sorry, but mandating a vaccination is not good community trust. You want to sit up here, you guys say all the time, we want community trust, we want to work with people. A heavy hand is not that. And although I know like, oh, it's coming from California. Oh my gosh, what a doozy of a week. And I'm sure some of you recognize my name today. It's been a doozy of a week for the ones that have gotten my phone calls this week. But the money comes from California. It's all fun and games until it fundamentally destroys our, our, what we have going here. You may sit up here and say, oh, the money coming into the school is really great until the teachers leave or you know, what if you mandate all these vaccinations and then the whole antibody dependent enhancement comes out that Dr. Malone says is gonna happen and people are really sick with autoimmune diseases. You are in the field. So to sit here and say, do no harm. You've got, I am a stay at home mom and I know about this stuff. It's because we're paying attention. If you're gonna try to mandate something in my body, I wanna know what the heck it is and what it's gonna do to my body. We have kids in the hospital right now with myocarditis. One was admitted today. It's so sad. Why, why are we doing this? The vaccine is harming young boys too. Myocarditis. You wanna put a football player and say, oh, I had a coach tell me, well, just get the vax, really? Are you gonna take the liability if my son gets myocarditis? Right now, they're being othered. If you're not vaccinated, you don't get to go back to school. I'm not even gonna give you, I'm not even gonna afford you an investigation on whether you were whatever. But that kid, this kid, he's got a vaccination, so he goes. There is no study of efficacy. Look at it, look at Israel, look at the cruise lines, look at DC. Thank you. Uh, Christy Creasy. Yes. I'm Christy Creasy again, representing the students and parents and teachers in the district. Again, I didn't feel like I was going to talk, but um, I got here and nobody had signed a stand up for our kids in these masks. And interestingly, she brings up liability. That was what I took away from the meeting last time. You had your lawyer come up and it was easy to just dismiss it behind, well, then the board takes liability. But that becomes the question. Um, Who's, who's liable for the side effects of a five-year-old wearing a mask all day? We talked about spitting in the mask and the yoga exercise and whatever is being, just the CO2 that they're breathing in. Who's, who's liable? Will you guys sign a liability waiver for our children for side effects that will come from wearing masks all day? Who, who's liable at the end? Same with the, the vaccines. Are you, are you liable? Because the vaccine makers aren't liable. It, it, if it comes down to board liability, I want to think that you guys got into this because you love the children. I feel like I just said that, but I mean, I've been liable since I got pregnant with my children. They've been sucking me dry since then. And I, I, I 
I am liable. You're right. If my kid shows up with no mask on and coughs on somebody, what happens next? For me, nothing. You're right. And maybe I'm willing to take that chance. That's really what it's coming down to is like, we're not being heard. And I understand. The health department says the school has to do this. The school has to blah, 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 blah. I brought my kids in here last week. They were really cute. If you're trying to remember them, they're probably just a dollar sign to you. I, I, these are our children. And I would like to parent my children. I don't want to co-parent with the government. I don't want to co-parent with the school board. We already, um, you guys provided a great service to the community prior to this. This has thrown everybody into this political warped arena of thinking where you, you have to stay politically correct. You can't upset these people. You can't, like we mentioned, the other boards, other, other areas are standing up for the people. And I ask that you really just say, is liability the reason? What is the reason that we can't look at the fact and say this is child abuse. It's child abuse. If we would have rewound five years and I said, hey, cover that kid, that kid, that kid, every single one, cover their mouths all day, all day, all day, you would have had reasons to stand up for these children. The virus is dangerous. Again, I'm not the doctor in the room, but the real numbers of how it's actually an issue for children, they're so low. Like compared to the flu, you weren't masking kids for the flu five years ago. The numbers are way higher for what was the negative effect of the flu versus what we're seeing with COVID now. Um, I have 20 seconds left and I regretted not doing this last time, but I just wanna pray. Lord Jesus, these are your children in this school district. And I pray for a heavy burden on the hearts of each person who has a role that they can make a difference. In your name I pray this, amen. Yvette Duchess. Yvette Duchess. Good evening. I am a parent of a, a five-year-old and a seven-year-old who just don't like to wear the mask. They go to school every day and they've complained about it. And I have a five-year-old who um, asked me the question of if God made air so we can breathe, why are we not able to breathe? And I did not have an answer for her as to why we are not doing that, why we are not letting our children breathe freely. Um, I spoke last week about my child who is in the dual immersion Mandarin class and the challenges of learning a new language with your mouth covered. I know later in the meeting it was discussed that there is a possibility of plastic and plexiglasses, plexiglass that can be used around their desk. So um, I'm here today to follow up on that action as well and uh, to see if in fact discretionary funds can be used to allow these children that are trying to learn a new language to be able to have their mouths viewed and view the mouths of others. Um, I, this is a really great program and I'm sure there's a lot of money that went into starting this great program. So um, the success of it, I would imagine, would be important to you all. Um, that is all I have for now. Thank you for your time. That's the last speaker. Thank you for all our speakers tonight. On behalf of the Board of Education, thank you for your comments. Um, as I stated previously, a staff member will contact you or follow up uh, with written communication. Thank you. <coughs> all right, next, Dr. Tompkins. Well, health has certainly taken a, its toll on all of us, and that definitely includes our students. Mental health has become a priority because of the, the national and local epidemic of mental health issues. We've seen it just exacerbated by the, the current pandemic. There's just been a lot of things in our society that kids uh, are going through that having mental health uh, supports really uh, um, increases the positive outcomes for them. Right now we have the resources to really uh, put towards our students and our staff to make sure that we can support their mental health. 
We want to be able to provide supports for kids so that they can learn because if their brains um, and their hearts feel happy, they're much more likely to be able to attain uh, great levels of academic achievement. Students do better. Student performance is enhanced when they are mentally and emotionally supported and healthy. It's really our goal to meet students' needs, making them feel safe, making them feel connected, relaxed in school settings so that they can engage better academically. I'm really excited about a lot of the work we're doing with mental health. I'm excited about how our multi-tiered system of support structures provide mental health Tier 1 services for all students, Tier 2 services for some, and Tier 3 services for the ones that need it the most. We're really looking at what a student needs and the individual student needs, and we're able to kind of group them together um, to provide that support, but we're able to kind of systematize it to provide supports for all of our kids at all of our schools in, in a very structured way. And the same is true for adults. You know, we've all been through this very challenging year, um, and, and, and nobody's walked away untouched by that. All staff in working with students, we need to make sure that our staff are, are mentally well and mentally healthy. With our district focusing on uh, our employee wellness, we're going to be in a better place to be able to help our students. Our students, our families, our teachers, our support staff really depend on us each and every day for us to be there for them, to make a difference, to help them engage, to support them, to help them uh, connect. So thank you so much for everything that you provide. Looking forward to a wonderful 21-22 school year. And thank you so much again for taking care of our families. Click it for me there, Mark. So that happened on purpose, just so you know, that was planned to have the video show first. I'm kidding. Board President Pollock, board members, Dr. Ben Rusto and Executive Cabinet. Um, I'm excited actually to be here today. And behind me, we have our awesome group of counselors and deans from our sites that actually participate in this work they're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, we're going to share a lot of information regarding our multi-tiered systems of support for student wellness and mental health. And, um, you know, we've had a, a, a big influx of, of resources. Our goal was to be coordinated and comprehensive uh, in that process and in, in uh, developing these services. So we're really excited to have this group here. Um, Recently, we actually completed um, our strategic plan here, you as a board and us as, a, as an organization. And we are really excited because we wanted to make sure that our work aligned uh, with our strategic plan. And as you uh, receive the information tonight, you'll see that we are well aligned under the areas of student uh, well-being, academic excellence, and equity. And we will speak to that um, as we go through the presentation. So tonight, you're going to hear a lot about the, um, the social emotional side of the work that we do. Um, there is an academic side to the work that we do, but there is a, a presentation that will be coming in the future uh, from our um, uh, Ed Services um, teammates. And I say teammates because this work um, has been done alongside uh, of our partners within the Ed Services division and, and other divisions too. Um, we all understand we all need to be on page with, with meeting the, the full needs of the whole child. Uh, for our school district. So we're going to focus more on the uh, mental health and student well-being side uh, of our MTSS um, framework and uh, you, you'll get a lot of information and you have a chance to ask a lot of questions too. So let's talk about the why. We've, we, we, we've just gone through a, a pandemic, we're still in the pandemic. The purpose of student service and the work that we do uh, in my division is to actually mitigate or address some of the barriers to student learning. We feel that it is our job to put resources in place to, to see if we can increase student engagement and their opportunities to learn. So that's, that's our main goal. But when you look at the why, uh, when, you, when you look at what families have gone through over the last, uh, last few years with regard to the pandemic, you've got loneliness, you've got an increase in anxiety, um, you've got um, uh, financial strife uh, in the home. We've got um, so many situations that have occurred, the trauma that has occurred, the loss of life uh, within families and, and students' families. And they're coming back to school with all of this on their shoulders. And so we, we feel it's very important um, that we address this in a comprehensive and coordinated way uh, so that folks can see there are some assurances in our system to how we want to address meeting the needs of our students right now. And so that's our attitude. What are we doing right now as we get our students back? So 
I'm going to call up Josh Gardenas and Sarah Gonzalez to come up and uh, speak to their part. And then we've got a whole slew of presenters here. So here we go. Thank you, Dr. Tompkins. Thank you, honorable board, esteemed colleagues of the district. My name is Josh Gudinez, and I am proud to be a CNUSD school counselor at Centennial High School. And for those of you that don't know, I have a little moonlighting job as the president of the California Association of School Counselors, where I have the honor of representing over 11,000 school counselors throughout the state of California. And in that role, I get to serve on a very important committee. It's the California Department of Ed's uh, Mental Health Coalition, led by Dr. Daniel Lee, who is one of our deputy associate superintendents. And about eight months ago, Dr. Lee had met with me and the executive director and said, school counseling has gone through an evolution over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, we had guidance counselors. And with the modern day school counselor, what we do is vastly different. And we have to tell that story because eight months ago, we weren't in our schools. And what he said was, I need you guys to put together a video that tells the story of the modern day school counselor and how they serve our parents, our teachers, our schools, and especially our students. And we did just that. And if we can play the video. We have to do better by our students. They want more. They want to be better. And so as a school counselor, I have an opportunity every single day to engage with our students and to truly connect with them as a human being and ask them, what do you need? And how can I help you get to your goal? I really just started having panic attacks every single day and I was terrified of getting sick. I would struggle from time to time. Like I, I could study a lot um, and when I went to take a test, I'd blow it almost every time. This has been by far my most challenging year. I've started going towards the counseling department in my, in my own ways, just sort of professionally and personally. You know, my daughter has challenges um, academically and um, because of her mutism, she doesn't speak to the teacher or other kids. And it's very, very scary for her. Eighth grade in middle school, my cousin had got shot on my street and unfortunately passed away. Uh, he told us that my aunt and my cousin made it out, but the, the rest of my family didn't. School counselors do so much more than school counseling. So school counselors' role in the social emotional learning is to build skills to help address mental health concerns. That exact week, my counselor wouldn't let me go to any of my classes and she would just stay there and hold me and watch me while I cry, pass me tissues. My school counselor, she met with me and we kind of started talking about like, I was feeling all these different things and she was able to get me into the school's uh, grief counseling. My counselors kind of became my only outlet for talking about it. But because she has worked with her counselor one-on-one, -on -one, she's built that relationship um, and she's built that trust and she can speak to her comfortably. We wanna help you first, students because we know that you are gonna make a difference. We know that you are the, gonna be the ones who take over our jobs and make the difference for the next set of generations. I didn't have to worry about, you know, going into the dark place where if I was with them and being involved with them, I felt safe. And I knew I was accepted and I knew that I could go to them at any time and I'd be, you know, listened to. And I think that I just felt safer in those spaces. When I'm with my counselor, it's just like a familiar feeling. They care about me. They care about where I'm gonna go. She would take the time and, and would look and would tell me, you know, let's start talking colleges. I think you're ready. Which makes me feel very happy when I see her speaking to someone else other than our, her family. They've been incredible because they have supported the social emotional needs, having one-on-one -on -one sessions with students, they're you know, doing Zoom sessions, they're calling them by phone. And so we invite you to 
ask for help from school counselors. We will do whatever we can to assist, but we will here be here to help more than anything with your child because your child is our child. Nosotros como consejeros escolares estamos aquí para servirles a ustedes, pero queremos aquí estar para ustedes para ayudarles en cualquier cosa que necesiten. If you need help with food, we got you. If you need help with your child's education, we will help you. If you need help with your child's future plans, we are here to assist. Where I was in high school to getting, you know, even to see some, probably one of the greatest successes of my life. You're gonna see me with my masters on my wall. I'm getting to where I wanna be. That's the power of the modern day school counselor. And that's what you have here. And in the last month alone, I do a lot of interviews as the head of California School Counseling. In the last month alone, I've done interviews with ABC, USA Today, and EdSource, most recently last week. And the one thing reporters always ask of me, yeah, Mr. Godinez, we understand what your vision is, but your boots on the ground. What do you see every single day? And the one thing that I am proud to say is that Corona Norco understands that student mental wellness and academic achievement go hand in hand. And that we have a board and a district that believes in school counseling and believes in putting students first. One of the stories in that video that you just saw is one of our own. And I invite up Ms. Gonzalez to tell you that student story. Hello, good evening, everybody. I'm Mrs. Gonzalez, or Sarah Gonzalez, not Mrs. Sarah Gonzalez, and I'm the intervention counselor at Eleanor Roosevelt High School. And very proud to be there. Go Mustangs. Um, yes, one of those students, I, always, I still get teared up when I see that, but one of those students was um, one of mine, and um, I worked with her for three years. Uh, she had lost four family members at once, and so, uh, that was that was really a struggle to keep coming to school and to be able to do what she needed to do and so through it was myself and uh, a lot of people partnered at the school to help her um, we run grief and loss groups in the end she was actually probably more the co-leader helping other students through um, even through the pandemic when we did the groups on d through zoom and i am proud to say she is now in college and she um, wants to be a school counselor and intervention counselor so i just wanted to tell you i mean we really we we we, we are a great district and we really help kids get to where they need to go. And, and I don't know if she would have been able to do that without all the support of just staff and her. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, board, executive cabinet. So, oh, we have good. to do better by our students. Oh, am I doing it? Good. You got it? Thank you. Okay. So the idea behind this is, is obviously we're only as good as we are as a system, right? So we have to make sure that whatever we're doing as a school system and a school district is consistent across all of our school sites. It's really important that a student that is at, at Temesco Valley gets the same type of care and same type of um, experience through the tiers as a student, let's say at Reagan, right? They're the same district. We need to make sure that, that the students in our district, as, as it says in our uh, strategic plan, have a consistent student experience. Um, and the way that we get there is by making sure that our employee training is in the same place that, that our staff knows what to expect and that we have processes to to align what we're doing for kids. And good, af good afternoon, my name is Jeremy Goins and I am an administrative director along with Tricia and structural support and that consistent student experience uh, is also, uh, we, we, we add the idea of equity into that experience, right? And what that means to us is that we give every student what they need when they need it. Right, and so you have that baseline experience, but as you heard from our counselors, Josh and Sarah, some students need more, right? And we have the idea that we wanna build systems so our students who need more can get more, and we're gonna share with you that system tonight. So it really, it, it, today is about, right now is about how we build that system, right? And we call that our multi-tiered system of supports. And we want to take you into the analogy of, of a student who, who breaks, uh, breaks his arm, right? A student who breaks his arm in the medical field, 
uh, that student is going to get consistent care regardless of uh, what hospital they go to because there are clinical standards of care. Right, it, that you treat a broken arm at, at, at Kaiser the same you do at, at Corona Regional. Um, now, there, however, depending on that break, right, we may have uh, additional needs on that student. You may need to see a, a specialist. You may need to see an orthopedic surgeon. You may need to have surgery. So we want to have systems just like our, our medical partners do so we can catch kids and give them what they need. That system for us is the tier system. Once again, in, in multi-tiered system of supports, tier one students get uh, our services for all students. For instance, all students have a school counselor. Tier two, our services are services for some students that need it most. Well, often we say about 15 to 20 percent of students are going to need more. And then our, our tier three is for the, the students that just need that extra um, intervention, that very specialized intervention. We have many examples of that as well. So, uh, so this is a, a, a picture of that common process that we use across schools. And we don't want to go too deeply into it uh, tonight, but we do want you to know that there are things that Tier 1 processes that all schools will use. All schools have a Tier 1 team that looks at their culture and their climate. All schools have uh, systems that will, will, you can refer a kid or you can use data to find a kid to go into tier two. And we have counselors that help support both and all three tiers. They catch those students. And we'll talk a little bit more about that system as we go through the night. And then we have the idea of quality assurance. Yeah. So in order to be able to make sure that we're providing a consistent experience for students, we need to have the oversight at the district level to make sure that what's happening at one site is happening across all sites and what's happening across the district. Uh, that being said, there is an MTSS coordinator that we know is uh, being approved, a uh, counseling coordinator, um, and then obviously we have our counselors that are being trained across the district to do the same thing across school sites. Um, that being said, the counselors have their own quality assurances that they're going to be talking about, um, and it's based on their own mission and vision that align to our district priorities um, and their professional organization standards as well. So, that being said, Josh. Josh. Thank you. So, as we were talking about, we have worked together to align our mission and vision. We no longer just see ourselves as individual school counselors. We are CNUSD counselors, TK through 12. We are aligning both vertically and horizontally. And unlike the guidance counselor of yesteryear, the guidance counselor of yesteryear did a lot of random acts of counseling, right? And was reactive. Something would walk into the office or they would plan if you came in and said, I need help. That's not the modern day school counselor. We have written a mission and vision that fits our vision now. And you'll notice that one of the key words up there is data driven. So we are looking at kids' attitudes. How do they feel about what we deliver at the tier one level with core curriculum, tier two small group services, tier three more intensive services. We look at their skill. Are we helping them develop skill that they can use to be academic achievers in the classroom? And we're looking at all of their achievements. So attitude, skill, and achievement. And with that, you will see that we take the uh, MTSS model, the multi-tiered systems of support, and one thing that we have in our um, standards is we have three domains. It's academics, it's social emotional, and it's college and career, which actually align with all of our pillars here in CNUSD. When I say we're revolutionary in this district, the rest of our profession is catching up to what we already do. So what we've done is taken the multi-tiered system of support and added our third domain because it was missing from there to give us the multi-tiered, multi-domain system of support where we have the academic, the college and career, and the social emotional pieces of the three tiers of MTSS. And you're gonna see all of this work. Over the last few years, and it continues into this year with hatching results, we are putting together a Corona Norco Unified School Counseling Handbook that will show you the alignment that is going on TK through 12, both vertically and horizontally. That being said, back to the medical model, um, you, you would have different types of hospitals or medical or insurances like Kaiser or Dignity Health. 
they have their own stamp on how they do things, but there are still standards for how they for how it's being done, right? Or for what's being done. That being said, we still want to have some site creativity because sites have different uh, cultures that need to be supported through this process. Um, so in doing that, um, in doing that, we're going to be talking about what we are doing for students. So that's going to be our next um, thing here. You want to see? Yeah. So, so with our with our students, we wanted to to recognize that when we we're about to lay out what are, what is the plan, right? What are the services we provide? And it's important to note that um, we have this idea of emergency response, right? We are in a pandemic, and we have uh, we have resources right now through expanded learning opportunities grant to provide uh, right now in time services for our students. So we're gonna do that. Part, uh, uh, in addition, we also have things that, uh, like as many of the things that Josh just said, that already are in place in our district and will continue in place. So we have a, uh, a, a combination of things that are for, for now, for that response and long term. So let's talk about the tier one common assurances that we have in this district. Uh, and today, uh, Trish is gonna start with the professional development that we had uh, this uh, last couple of weeks. Yes. All right, so we have some great information to share regarding our trauma-informed essay. Um, on, uh, on June 30th, August 5th, and August 6th, all of our school sites, all of our school sites engaged in this learning. Um, and it was a great time for staff to come together, and the learning was on more good days. Trauma-responsive practices in the classroom. Um, Classified staff were invited as well, um, and we have great feedback from our staff on how it went. So, how satisfied were you with the presentation style, activities, and resources for today's session? We had 94% of our staff give it a four or five, 94% of our staff give it a four or five on this one, which is a huge response and would be considered clinically significant. Statistically significant. Sorry. And we wanted to show that you know uh, the the presenters made the point that you don't uh, work out once uh, once a year and uh, you know become uh, healthy and fit, right? You have to ha work out consistently, and so we don't think that one training does it. We are providing year-long training for our, our sites, uh, monthly training. So we had our S day for all sites, and then we have the, these options every month for sites. We're really excited about the ongoing support to support uh, social emotional learning. And we've given you guys all the descriptions of the upcoming trainings at the back of your packet tonight, so you can review that. That being said, one of the most impactful parts of the training that we had was on the discussion of automatic negative thoughts, and they call them ants. This is the one thing that all of our staff, many of them reported to this as being a huge learning piece for them. And we want to kind of explain it to you because we feel like it has a huge, it will have a huge impact on not only adult behaviors, but student behaviors as well. So our presenters explained automatic negative thoughts as being those things that kind of creep into our head and, and kind of write the story for us, sometimes even without, um, without us knowing. So some of them are listed up there. Um, some of the ones that, they, that we pointed out that we, we both recognize we see a, a lot of times is the idea of all or nothing thinking. You've seen kids before, I'm never going to be good at this, all right? I, there's no way I'll ever understand this, that it's an extreme, right? Sometimes we have, uh, as adults, the idea of, oh, I should have done this better, I should have said this, I wish I would have done this, the idea of shoulding uh, uh, everywhere. So we're always saying that we should. Now, those two things are some of our ants. So what we wanted to be able to talk about is what are the implications in the classroom for this stuff? Um, so this is a great example because as soon as the adults understand the idea of automatic negative thoughts, there are adults that then, then share this with students. So this is a student from Orange Grove High School. So if you look, what they do with the student is they have them say, what is your automatic negative thought? So if you look in the column to the right, uh, that they recorded, I got expelled, I'm the worst child, my parents hate me, I'm a failure. This was the student's feelings about something. So the teacher asked them, to, you know, record your thoughts, right? So she did that. Then what they did is they took the list before of the automatic negative thoughts and they had the student name, what was she doing, okay? So she realized that she was catastrophizing, overthinking and labeling. And then moving forward, she was asked to replace those things with something that was a better story, right? That would help her deal with whatever that feeling was. 
So I made a mistake and I'm going to learn from it. My parents are angry, but they still love me. This type of skill is something that, that we taught, that, that we are teaching our staff throughout the year, but we started on the S day. And it's great because this is the type of skill that students need, right? Be able to overcome adversity, be able to have that self-awareness and self-management. This is what we taught our staff, and then they can then teach our students. And so when you think of tier one, you think of things like this where it's proactive, right? We're not waiting for a student to have a negative thought. We're, we're teaching them the skills knowing that, that all students ultimately will. Another tier one support that we are going to be doing at, at all of our schools is providing wellness centers, also known as calm rooms. And we're going to show a quick one minute video from JFK of the work that they're doing uh, over there, the one on the right, Mark. Thank you. You can go ahead and turn the volume up, Mark. It's muted. This year, my mom got me the perfect backpack for back to school. These colorful binders help me to stay organized. These headphones are just what I need for studying. This Evolve Wellness Center is the perfect place for anybody to find peace of mind, reflect, connect, ground, and set goals in order to evolve into their best self. This is our intake station, our first station. Here, you'll be able to fill out our online form so we can best serve you. This is station number two, our mindfulness station. And this station will work on breathing work, grounding, stillness, anything you need to do to calm down. This is our third station, reflection. In this station, you'll meet with a peer counselor, do journaling, and thought mapping. This is our fourth and final station. This station is for goal setting. Here, you'll figure out what you intend to do in the future, how you can best care for yourself, and ultimately evolve. So hats off to JFK and their staff for, uh, for being outside the box and really think about how to support students. Uh, we feel like this should be at every school. If you can hit play on the other one, Mark. At John Stallings and many of our elementary rooms, they have mindfulness rooms where they have, again, spaces for students where you can do different, different activities, circles, you can use your counseling team. And so we want these at all school sites. We have a plan to have them at all school sites. Now we know that space is, is a priority and so it's not gonna be overnight, but uh, over, over time, we're gonna develop these at all of our school sites uh, using our expanded learning grant uh, opportunities money. So, go ahead, Mark. Thank you, and then Sarah's gonna talk about some of the impacts of the, these kind of spaces with students. Hello again. Um, so we have a uh, wellness room that we put together a couple years ago, and it's where we use we hold our groups, and we have we open it up at lunch so kids can play games. If they're new, they get to make friends with other students. And we also have in um, we have pods, and in our pods we have spaces that we've made where it's a room where if a student's waiting for a counselor. It has it's a it's a safe place where they can sit and they can um, color, they can play with clay. There's breathing exercises, it's just a space where students can be, especially if they're upset or they're just like, they're having to wait for us, we don't wait them out in public, so they're like in this space. And what was so, what's so cool about this is the students have, uh, it started probably like about a couple months after it opened, the students have started leaving notes for other students. And so we'll leave stickies in there and they'll, they'll blast the board. I just took them down from the, the, the last year and so there's a fresh board up there. But this was one I found Friday afternoon. So I hadn't even put out the stickies yet. And I don't know what student did this, but they left a note for another student. And I thought, wow, this is just beautiful. So it's, it's just a really cool thing that I think that we're doing and giving these spaces for students to kind of help others. Good evening, board, executive cabinet. You know, our schools are increasingly multicultural, multilingual with students from diverse social and economic backgrounds. Social emotional learning provides that foundation that is equitable, safe, and, uh, and positive for positive learning, enhancing the student's ability to succeed. So research shows that when SEL is, is implemented with fidelity, it not only improves achievement by 11 percent percentile points, but it also increases pro-social behaviors, such as kindness, sharing, and empathy, improves student attitude towards school, and reduces depression and stress among students. So what we are doing is we are gonna provide a common assurance across all our schools for them to have a character program or framework of some sort. 
So the ones that we have that, that our that our schools have uh, uh, implemented are uh, Leader in Me, Capturing Kids' Hearts, Character Counts, and then at a couple of schools like at uh, Santiago, they have a framework, a multi-tiered system of support framework, Be a Shark, that's very successful. And then also at uh, River Heights, they have the, the Colts Way. And it's, it's interesting when you go to River Heights and you see a student that might not be doing what they need to do, that one of the adults will come, come by and say, is that the Colts Way? What is the Colts Way? And then the student knows that and they'll repeat it back. So this is what we're looking at uh, moving forward. Thanks. Good evening, board and cabinet. Uh, my name is Randy Thomas. I'm the coordinator uh, that oversees uh, counseling services in the district. Uh, so we're going to talk about Tier 1. Now, Tier 1 supports are designed for all students. So all students get them. So the big question is, how do we know what all students need from a social emotional standpoint? And this is our answer to that. We're going to start using universal screeners to address different things, where we can find things like growth mindset, social awareness, self-efficacy, and self-management, and figure out where the kids are, where all our students are at every level, uh, and then we can address their needs from there. So we test ran this universal screener idea during the Summer Boost program. The Summer Boost program is interesting because we've never had school counselors run a, a summer school program before. At every level we had counselors, usually high school summer school, they're there for a few days and then they leave, they schedule and then, and then they're gone. Uh, so we had a counselor full time at the high schools and we had a counselor full time at all the uh, intermediate and elementary levels. So we ran the universal screen as sort of test run to see what kind of information we can gather. And you can see the one on the left there, it says I stayed calm when others bothered or criticized me. That that's comes from the, the uh, idea of self-management. And you can see uh, about half the kids are able to stay calm without a problem. But it also shows us there's about half the kids that are irritable and trouble and they've been away from everybody for a year and a half and we have to bring them back in. This was an elementary school, this particular one. So that shows us um, what kind of information school counselors can look at and where they can go and what kind of activities they can do school-wide in order to address those kinds of information. The, the one on the bottom right was the same elementary school uh, but this was the, the idea of self-efficacy. So it says I can earn an A in my class. And so elementary kids are great because look, look how they rebound. They're like, I'm coming back and I'm going to get A's. So you got 48% mostly confident that they can get an A. You got 37% that they're like, yeah, I'm totally getting an A. So they're coming back with the mindset of I'm going to do this and it's great, right? The interesting thing about universal screeners is we can throw this back out there about, about mid-year and see are the kids still there? Like, where are they at now? So we can make adjustments and make sure we're meeting the needs of all students based on the feedback we're getting here. Now, when we have a full school year as well, we can, we can get some data at the end of the school year to see what the outcomes were, what the impact was, and what the whole program overall is doing for our students and make adjustments as needed from time to time. Now, one other thing that we added in the high school questionnaire, which was very interesting, because keep in mind, we don't usually have a like a socially emotional counselor at high school level in the summertime. But the question was, uh, would you like to see a, a school counselor for support during summer school? Uh, this is only the second session. Uh, there's about 4,100 students in that session. 686 of those students said, yes, I want to see a counselor for support. So that gives us some information that, wow, the kids are reaching out to us. They really need us. They want us. So. Uh, that is a very interesting piece of information for us where we know that we got to support the kids a little more and give them more of that social emotional piece. So uh, that's how we're going to address the tier one and meet their needs and find them. So, and the counselors are doing great at this. So thank you. Good evening, board and the executive cabinet. My name is Margo McDowell, and I'm a counselor at Norco Intermediate. And I'm gonna to talk to you about the Summer Boost Program. I was very fortunate to work both sessions at Todd Elementary, and it was probably the best summer of my life, even though I worked a month of it. Um, I did get a chance to go on vacation, so that was nice as well. But um, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you guys for allowing school counselors to be a part of that program, because we've never had that opportunity or experience before. 
So coming into the summer boost program, there really wasn't a curriculum set for counselors. There was something provided for teachers. So Mrs. Murs and myself got together, we scrambled and we came up with lessons for the entire session for the homeroom teachers to deliver to their students. Um, I was in a unique situation because Todd is pre was preschool to middle school at that time. So I had to differentiate those lessons and provide the same content, making sure that they were receiving access to the same information, but it needs to, to be accessible for preschool, ele lower elementary, higher elementary, and then our middle school. The feedback that I got from the students, they were like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. We did bubble breathing and they would be outside with their bubbles and talk to me about what bubble breathing meant. The teachers were very excited about it as well. Um, I would have the lessons ready to go and they kept saying, you know, I really want to use this with my own classroom when I get back. So I think as long as t we counselors are providing things that are meaningful, impactful, and easily accessible for our teachers to use, I think they're willing to do those things. It's just giving them that support and that time to make sure that they can get it done. Um, I also wanted to let you know that I had a parent come up to me and say, um, you know what, she goes, I was wondering what was going on with my child. She got into an argument with her brother and she told him she needed a timeout because she needed to use her bubble breathing. And she's like, where did that come from? Um, she happened to be um, an upper grade teacher, so they were doing something different. And then she realized that the bubble breathing came from the SEL lesson that her child had done in class that day. So not only are they taking that information, they're synthesizing it and they're applying it as well. They just need to be given the opportunity to learn those things. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, if you look up here, um, I loved going back to elementary school. That was my jam. Um, Mrs. Mers and I, we have no problem embarrassing ourselves to relate and connect with kids. So her school site did something with the galaxy, I believe, and my theme was um, super our counselors are superheroes and so I went in dressed like that and it was a way for me to connect with the kids and they would see me and I would say Shh, don't tell that's my superpower counseling is my superpower and it made them really excited and then I made them many super counselors and they um, promised that they were going to be nice to their friends look for people who didn't have friends and and invite them to play if they saw people who were um, sitting by themselves and so we were able to reach a large group of kids I also think that it was amazing to too, because if you look at what the kids are doing, um, they're doing a cooperation lesson and they were doing bouncing back and resiliency, but these are things that can be embedded across the curriculum. So that's actually a STEM activity, but it turns into cooperation and working together. And then the writing piece is, you know, using an acrostic to talk about what it means to be resilient. So you're taking those SEL components and you're turning them into curriculum as well. So we can work with the teachers to make it even more accessible. Um, the last thing I want to say is we also did some meeting the counselor lessons. As he was saying as well, elementary school students came in to see me as well once they realized what a counselor is and why they would want to see them. So we were able to see kids that we typically wouldn't see during the summertime. Um, so I just want to thank you for that opportunity. And if you decide to do it again next uh, summer, I'm definitely on board. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Marlena Reyes and I'm an elementary school counselor. I'm assigned to John Adams Elementary. I have been an elementary school counselor for 20 years. The reason is because we have a lot of fun and fun doesn't mean that learning's not happening. And so with that being said, oh, something happened to my to my my thing, but that's OK. It, it's all supposed to come in one at a time. They're supposed to fly in. I don't know what happened here. <laughs> so I'm going to be sad for a second. Um, all right, so I, I am. And, and because I am, I recognize the sadness and I'm going to move on from it. Um, so over the course of my 20 years, I have had the opportunity to be at one school site, two school sites, three school sites, and five school sites, okay? I am happy to share today that we are, for this year, ele each elementary school will have a full-time counselor on their site. There we are doing the happy dance up there. Um, and what I want to speak to is um, our tier one and what it looks like, but what has changed and what is changing because my friends, change is a happening right now um so let's speak to that what being at one school site does for us is it allows ourselves to embed ourselves in the culture and climate of our schools 
That being said, we've already, Dr. Illick has mentioned, it's been mentioned before that and in the video, relationships are the bridge, okay? So being at one school site allows that visibility. It allows us to not only build relationships, but strengthen the ones that we already have, which directly leads to supporting. And that support is not just our teachers, but that's our students, that's all our stakeholders on that school site. Those things are already happening, okay? So our tier one classroom lessons, which should have flown in, right, on its own, but that's okay. T counselors are getting into the classrooms more. Where before, because we were part-time, we might do one lesson, two lessons in one grade level a year. We are doing, some of us are doing, and keep in mind that not all things are across the board because we are, again, looking at the needs of our individual school sites. We're looking at the data to assess those needs. So certain things are being done in certain places for the needs of that school. But we're looking at being able to do series of lessons. So we, um, meeting the needs of my school site right now, knowing that our kindergartners have never been on campus, guess what? Neither have our first graders. And our second graders have had very limited access to campus. So I'm doing a whole series of 12 weeks, every week in their classroom on social emotional learning, from meet the counselor, to how to make friends, to impulse control, to mindfulness, to careers, okay? Those things are not able to be done when we're at differentiated school sites. So we are doing that, that has changed. We're able to offer programs, which we did in the past, but we're able to offer more of them. We're able to be more robust in the programs that we offer. We're able to do clubs, interventions. We have a counselor right now whose data, because they're year round, has shown that attendance is an issue at their school site. So she is working with admin and staff to support attendance school-wide at that tier one, and then at that tier two with some small group interventions. That also leads to how much um, they're able to recognize those students within those programs. So in the past, you might have a school site Tuesday and Thursday. So you leave a student with, okay, you're gonna work on this skill, let me know on, two, on a Thursday, let me know on Tuesday how that goes, right? Now we're able to say, I'm here for you tomorrow and I'm gonna check in on that student tomorrow. I meet with them on Thursday, I'm gonna check in with them on Friday because they need that recognition. They need to know that you're there and you're gonna keep with them. That being said, we have a counselor who, um, and a lot of us are at our gates or greeting in the mornings on our campuses and saying goodbye as they leave. We have one school counselor, um, and there, there could be many more. These are just, we haven't met as a group yet, but these are some of the stories, um, who is recognizing birthdays every day. She's sending a um, bookmark to the students who have a birthday that day. She's at the front gate, and her students are like, she'll say happy birthday to them. One, they're amazed that she knows who they are, right? Especially with the mask. But two, they're like, you know it's my birthday today? Right? That helps kids with attachment that brings them to school that makes them want to be there okay and we know what that does then for attendance and academics right so we have that happening our turnaround and response rate is highly affected by us being on a campus again with that whole thursday to tuesday if a teacher says hey i want you to come into my classroom you say great what day what time i'm here all week right what that does for our teachers is it builds trust they ask us to do more they want us more in their rooms we are the mental health professionals on those campuses we have that mental health expertise and at times it's not utilized but now it is being utilized to the nines i will just let you know for us traditional we've only been in school for two weeks and i can't tell you what my calendar looks like our year rounds are reporting the same thing at their sites um our parent outreach what we can do with that this year, last year we did newsletters, but now just being more accessible to our parents, again, at the front gates. They're not a lot on campus yet, so we'll look at that later, but you know, just at the front gates or if we're doing traffic, you know, helping with traffic duty. 
We have a counselor who is happy to report that for the first time ever, she's going to be a part, an active part of her PTA. She is looking forward to being on the PTA's board. I have been a member of John Adams PTA board for about nine years now, and no other counselor's ever been able to experience when I explain to them what that does for me, attending all PTA events at night and how I interact with parents through PTA. And now we have counselors saying, hey, I'm gonna do that. Okay, that's opening those doors. Our tier one PBIS committees being able to be there for those meetings because you're there all week, regardless of what day they put that meeting on, you are there for it. Our district and nationally observed events, those are things we've done in the past. Um, random acts of kindness week, what if weeks, right? But our ability to now, instead of saying, okay, we've planned out the week. Okay, somebody's gotta take Monday, Wednesday, and Friday because we won't be here you know, and cover those things. Those logistical pieces we're on campus to do now. So we're gonna be able to do those things. We haven't had any yet, but we are planning folks within our limits still. So what that does for us is that allows us to be far more proactive rather than reactive. And that makes a huge difference. Um, I'd like to share a story. And I did ask this counselor first, if I could share a story with you. Um, at the end of last year, I spoke to a counselor on the phone and I called her about some data numbers and she broke down sobbing, crying, okay? Well, we counselors are in touch with our feelings, so you know that happens, but, and I said, what's going on? And she said, you know, I just feel like a failure. She says, I tried really hard. I don't have the numbers. Her job satisfaction was at the bottom of where it could possibly be. Now, as a human being, you wanna say, it's pandemic, like don't worry, right? Like there's reasons for that, but it didn't because that's not what she needed. And I said, I'm sorry. And I let her talk and she said, and you know, it's not just this year. And she mentioned it, she's like, I'd like to chalk it up to pandemic, but it's not just this year. My teachers have not let me in their classrooms. They're not asking me to do lessons. I, I'm not being utilized. And she just felt like she didn't know if she was being effective at all. And we all have had jobs, you know, and I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but it's the lowest probably that you can ever feel. And I felt that coming through the phone. And I, I, I said, I, I'm so sorry, how can I help? And she said, you know, just listening helps. And I said, anytime, I'm a phone call away. And I said, so, you know, it was at the end of the year. And I said, okay, so she's a year round. And I said, you can take a break. Like, what are you doing? Kind of change the subject. Yes, okay, great. So when we heard that we were at one school site, um, you know, I'm a school counselor and I'm empathetic, but sometimes the human in me goes, okay, she's gonna give up that school because I don't know that she should hang out there, right? If they're not gonna utilize her. So I thought for sure that would be the school site she'd give up and she'd keep the other school. And when I got, came back, because it's a year round, um, I was surprised to find out that she kept that year round school site. And I spoke to her on the phone. I gave her a call and I said, hey, how you doing? Like checking in with her. And she was ecstatic. She, it was like a talking to a total different person on the phone. And I was like, what? I'm like, hey, you sound like what's going on? She's like, oh my gosh, Marlena, my teachers are asking me to come in. They're utilizing my expertise. I'm doing classroom guidance lessons, friendship issues on the playground. They're calling me for that. It's about embedding in the culture and climate of your school. It's about them knowing that you're there. And it's one of those where you could think about it as, what do we weigh? Okay, well, so what? The counselor's happy with her job. So what? She's got job satisfaction, right? What does that mean for kids when we weigh that? But it's not about a scale and weight. It's about a cyclical cycle that happens. Job satisfaction, your thinking and your feeling affects your behavior. When you think and feel amazing and fantastic and productive, you are going to do more. When you do more, the people that you do it for notice and they recognize and they say, wow, we want more. And that cycle continues. And that cycle doesn't just benefit that counselor, that cycle benefits the students, the parents, and the staff at that school, and in essence, affects the community. Having said that, I would like to thank this board, this district, for 
helping us to put one counselor at every elementary site, for recognizing that early intervention matters, that early intervention counts. Margo attested to that with Summer Boost and working with those elementary kids. And now we are seeing it every day with having one counselor at every school site. So thank you very much for that. That's it. I am Susanna Mers and I am at El Cerrito Middle School. Um, amongst classroom lessons, oh, I should probably change the slide. <laughs> Amongst classroom lessons and school-wide activities, as well as all of our other Tier 1 approaches that we take to support our students' needs to be intentional by using data to see what, what the data does show, right, to support our needs. I'm going to give you a little snapshot of what we did during COVID, during the shutdown. The intermediate counselors were able to come together and collaborate and host activities such as an anime club, Baking with MERS, a virtual YEMP day, and two in intermediate level You Got Talent YouTube events, which received over 4,500 views. With all the successful opportunities we were able to bring to school, connect, to bring to social connection and engagement for our students while they were at home during the shutdown, I learned from students and parents through emails how appreciative and meaningful these experiences were. One student saying that she loved baking with MERS so much and that it was so much more than just baking. It was lifelong lessons as well. Another parent sent me a picture or pictures of her son baking and was beyond thrilled that he had found something like this to keep him uh, connected because he was struggling so much while during the shutdown, not seeing his friends and not being at school. With the new year starting, these supports will carry over, creating a strong Tier 1 SEL to support our students' social connection, development, and engagement. And I'm especially excited to see the evolution of Baking with MERS turn into a wellness club that will be offered at El Cerrito next, or next year, this year, um, to continue our Tier 1 support. And actually, after our, uh, our teacher PD that we had, the teacher that I'm uh, co-teaching this group with, we decided to integrate the ANTS activity into our club to help students combat those negative self-talk because we understand that that is one huge barrier and obstacle to their ability to be truly successful in the classroom and beyond. Thank you. Good evening, um, I am Hilda Castanon. I am a counselor at Roosevelt High School East M Academy. And last school year, high school counselors collaborated to create common assurances at the tier one level. You'll see our lessons in the slide, oh, right here. Um, our goal was to make sure that all students at each grade level receive the same information counselors are delivering. The common lessons we created all included the three counseling domains, which include academic, college career, and social emotional learning. Um, us having these common lessons ensure that a ninth grade student at Santiago is and will receive the same counseling lesson a ninth grade student at Roosevelt High School. It's exciting to see this roll out. And what is most exciting is that all students at every grade level at our high schools are practicing social emotional skills in every school counseling lesson that is delivered at the tier one level. And we continue to promote the importance of mental health wellness and support for our students. Thank you. Good evening, uh, I'm here tonight. We're gonna talk about some tier two uh, common assurances. I wanna thank everyone for sharing those tier one, which are common assurances that are available for all students. So we're gonna share some tier two uh, common assurances that are uh, developed and designed for some students. Um, I wanna start out by sharing uh, the steps um, program that's available at yeah go ahead Mark. yeah so the steps program was has always been available at some schools but one of our tier two common assurances that we're doing is we will be uh, providing a steps program at every elementary school so in the steps program we have paraeducators that are trained uh, to design uh, to help students with empathy, emotional management, anger management, and problem solving. Um, and in this video, um, you'll see 
one of our uh, own RSP paraeducators, Mrs. Enfield, that trains our steps aides to provide uh, these interventions and the support to our students. All right, good evening, board. I, first, I have to turn around. Counselor, you guys are amazing. I just have to give you a round of applause because you guys were so awesome. They have so much energy. I know I have a lot of energy, but you guys are just killing it. But I get the opportunity today to introduce to you guys a mentorship opportunity that we have. If you think back over your life, I'm sure you can go back and say, here are some people that helped me, mold me, pushed me along the way, and really kept me on track. And that is what we want to do for our students. So this tier two program uh, that we're going to be working with is called Rescue a Generation. And we are excited to bring this organization to Corona Norco Unified School District. And it is a, a organize, organization that was started by the guy in the middle. His name is Jose Rodriguez. Jose Rodriguez is from San Bernardino and he had a really, really rough upbringing, but he made some really poor choices along the way. And if it was not for mentorship and people who poured into his life, he would not be the motivational speaker going across the country and starting his own mentorship program. So his background really helps him to really go in and understand with kids. So how is this program um, going to work here at our district? A Couple of things before I go there is the purpose of this program is to really help students. It's not counseling, it is mentoring. These parents, uh, these people are coming on our campuses to coach, to support, to help lead our students. And they do that by doing several lessons over a 10 week um, course, which includes teaching them about positive self-esteem, how to make good choices, um, and it also helps support them in attendance and setting goals. And this is something that we're excited because we were able to pilot this at Rainy two years ago. And what we did see was a huge increase in attendance with the students that were part of the program, as well as academics. So we're excited to bring it to all of our secondary schools this year. So all intermediate schools, as well as all of our high schools will be a part of this. Each school will be allowed to have 60 students be a part of this program. So at the end of the year, we will have over a thousand students who will have gone through this group mentorship. They will receive two hours per week of mentoring. It will be in a small group of 30, either 15 to 30. It just depends on how it's set up at each school. Once again, they do a 10 week curriculum that talks about positive thinking. What does success look like? Dream building, goal setting and leadership. That's just to name a few of those things. Um, how do students get in part of this program? We're looking at four different criteria. Number one is attendance. If students have had um, more than 10% absences, which we consider chronically absent at that point, we want them to be looked at. Also students who are struggling that have uh, more than two or more D's and F's, D's or F's, excuse me, as well as office referrals. It's really difficult this year to get all of that data because we weren't on the site most of last year. So we we're allowing the schools to have a little flexibility on how they target students, but those are some of the criteria we wanna look at because at the end of the program, we wanna see was there an increase? Was there a change? We wanna be accountable to make sure that this program is really working in our schools. We also have asked our school site leaders to make sure that they target, not necessarily target, but if students fall in the category of foster and homeless, that they be given priority for this mentorship program. So that's a quick overview. We are ecstatic to have uh, Rescue a Generation come onto our campuses, and I look forward to being able to share with you the successes that we have. Thank you. All right, well, we've all heard the idea that you can't pour from an empty cup, right? And that adults, in order for us to be able to put a mask on others, we have to put the mask on ourselves. So we wanna make sure that we're pouring into our staff as well, because they are going to be, um, they're gonna be instrumental in making sure all of our students are successful this year and beyond. That being said, one of our tier two interventions is going to be an em employee wellness seminars that are gonna be happening throughout the year. It'll be placed through our professional development department um, onto KickUp, which is a system that we use um, to get people enrolled and get people involved in that. It's gonna be run by uh, Joe Antonelli. Um, some of the things being covered, Joe is very good about everything with brain science. So there's gonna be a lot of brain science that goes into how we're gonna treat, teach our staff to work on their stress, to uh, make sure that they have 
positive um, strategies in order to, to work with students as well. So we're very, very excited about that one. And, and so uh, I wanted to share real quickly about how a student would get into a tier two, mm -hmm. into a tier two intervention. And so uh, there, this is a video, but it's okay, you can't see it, but ultimately it is a group of educators at Barton and what they're doing is they take data from those universal screeners, they take referrals from, from staff, from students who self-refer from parents and then they get that data and they assign those students different interventions based upon the need of each student and, and so that is so it's very systematic in the way that we ensure that no student um, no, no st student falls through the cracks it's okay we can go to the next And then Alexis Goddard's gonna come tell us some of the tier two work that our counselors do. Hello everybody, my name is Alexis Goddard. I'm a school counselor at Centennial High School. Um, I also have the pleasure of serving as a board director for the California Association of School Counselors. Um, while they pull this up, we are gonna be talking today about the tier two and how school counselors use our skills and domains of academic, college and career and social emotional to support our students. For us, while we're Looking at our tier two, I'm gonna look at my notes because then I can't refer to that. Um, so we are proactively querying and assessing data to meet our district level and site needs. As you've heard, we collaborate at elementary, intermediate, and high school, but also articulate vertically to make sure that we're supporting students in different areas. This can include um, using our data from FastBridge, grades, GPA, attendance, behavior, along with data that may not be collected or seen through the data we have in our student information system. So through student needs assessment, our panorama data, and then from student voice. We really take into account our student voice when we're looking at it. Just as tier two, one, our tier two has some common assurances that are used district wide. There we go. So for our common assurances, we have things that we deliver at every single site. From That would include our small groups, and like I said, some are based on site need, that depending on what we need. But some things are district-wide that we have to provide. For example, this year we know our grief and loss for our students are struggling. Many of our intervention counselors at our high schools have already started our grief and loss groups. I know today our intervention counselor at Centennial had her first group. I know Ms. Gonzalez shared with me that she's also starting her group. We also have um, a spike in stress and anxiety among our students. So that is one group that we're gonna be offering right away across the board. Today, you're also gonna have the chance to hear from some of the students who've been a part of these groups. Our tier two is not just small groups though. It can be large group workshops, either over a series, one time, or for an individual classroom need. If a classroom is struggling, like in the past, when I worked at El Cerrito, we went into those, the, our special ed classrooms and provided them with self-management skills to help them because that was a need in those classes. As we're looking, coming out of this pandemic, we're not only looking at our academic needs, but our social emotional needs to help our students be successful. When, as we go through the year, we also plan on collecting our data pre-post from our students' perspective, along with that academic, behavior and attendance data. And we will create, as you see, there's two data reports showcasing some of the data work from our tier two interventions at Centennial and Roosevelt High School from last year. These data, um, these intervention groups targeted our students with three or more Fs at Centennial um, for our ninth grade Hispanic males. And at Roosevelt, it also targeted students with three or two or more Ds and Fs. We did see decreases. And we do plan on doing these groups this year to hopefully see more decreases. I do wanna share with you a video of one of our students who participated in a grief and loss group at our intermediate level. This is a student who is now doing very well and became a leader in the group and is now using his skills he learned in group to support others. Oh, okay. Well, he's talking about how, <laughs> how effective his school counselor was and how supportive and he looks forward to continuing it this year. On the next slide. Oh. 
On the next slide, kind of gives you a snapshot of different interventions that we offered next year, or last year and that we will continue to offer. As you see, we have self-efficacy groups that were done at the elementary level. We have some Shake It Off with MERS and um, Mr. Fraze over at uh, Intermediate, as well as social emotional health, Go With The Flow, and of course, making sure that all of our students feel welcome on our campus. This is our last um, information that we wanna share with you. As we said, student perspective is most important. We wanna make sure that we're impacting student success, but also making them feel safe on campus, making sure that they feel supported and they know their school counselor is there for them. Today we're gonna hear about, this is part of a video um, discussing the social emotional uh, strategies that we implemented last year at the tier one, tier two level. Um, the student's gonna be sharing her participation not only in our classroom lessons that we did on stress management and managing anxiety, but her experience in a small group. Our whole mission right now is to meet the needs of our students where they're at right now. Mental health is something that I've always struggled with, especially dealing with school. So I really liked that like we were taking like steps to kind of learn about it more. So it kind of like added like an extra like feeling of support in the group. We learned about different things that we could use to calm ourselves down if we can feel like an anxiety attack or a panic attack. Still, my counselor got me to where I needed to be to be able to grow. So whenever my friends are having an anxiety attack or something, I try to guide them through it. And I try to give them any advice that has helped me over the years, just to kind of and make sure that they know that they're not alone and that they're, it will get better and stuff like that. We are doing the best that we possibly can, devoting all of our resources, all of our innovation, everything to meeting the needs of our students right now, because it matters right now. So as you see, this is just one of many stories, but I can tell you from working with students directly and being on our team at Centennial that we are here and excited to help support our students at every level we possibly can. Thank you. So we saw uh, common assurances in tier one. We saw common assurances in tier two. Now we're gonna look at some common assurances in tier three. So the first example uh, we're gonna share tonight is happened through the Student Attendance Review Board, which is really designed to help students or address students with chronic uh, absenteeism. But let's take a look and see uh, how we use that Student Attendance Review Board to help some of our, of our neediest students. Imagine you're in this scenario. You're a junior in high school, you're on track to graduate, everything is great. All of a sudden, your world turns upside down. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Now you're not sure if you're gonna graduate. You lose focus, you lose contact with your friends, and you lose contact with your school. What do you do now? This is a situation that we found ourselves in with many of our students here in Corona Norco Unified School District. We turned to one of our processes that we already have in place, the Student Attendance Review Board. The Student Attendance Review Board is usually seen as a punitive and a negative process that we use to help students that have attendance issues. So we thought we can be proactive, be supportive, and help our students through this process to get them reconnected, to develop a plan, and to provide supports in order to get them to graduate. This is part of our overall umbrella, which is multi-tiered system of supports, which we take an old process that was not effective and by being restorative and supportive, turning it into an effective practice. Of the 87 students that we met with, 75 of them actually graduated. The 12 that didn't are in summer school right now, working on graduation. What you'll see next are students that will share their story through this experience. About two months before we graduate, actually, um, people from the district, they reached out to me and they let me know that I was, in, I was like not gonna graduate, I was in danger of not graduating, and they helped me set up a plan to graduate. I started going to the parent center and it was great because it was a place for me to just think about work, just do my work for two, three hours and really get work done there. And right to do that school were amazing, they were all so supportive, they all really wanted us to graduate. I wanna thank everyone who helped me graduate my teachers, the staff of the Parent Center, 
my family, I couldn't have done it without you. My name is Avani Gonzalez and I graduated from Levy Pollard High School. Hi, thank you. I graduated on this. <laughs> thank you, Elia. <laughs> Henry did it. My name is Tina Cristiano, so I went to Corona High. Um, the SAR program helped me a lot. They pushed me to make it to the end because I was on the edge of not graduating. I plan on attending community college to become a teacher for kids with special needs. Thank you, Ms. Perry, for your help and your encouragement and telling me that I was going to make it to graduation. Hello, my name is Mark Gonzalez, and I would like to thank Ms. Elias for helping me out so much. I gave up a lot of hope thinking I wasn't going to graduate, and thanks to her, I'm able to graduate and be here. I'd like to thank um, Elia for helping me um, doing my school because at first I was not wanting to do this and she really got on my case to do this, so I'm really thankful for her. My name is Gladys Jaramillo and my experience on graduating was not as difficult as I once thought it would be. All I needed was some clarity, words of inspiration, which I did get from Dr. Elek and Mrs. Elia, who reached out throughout my whole process to graduation day. And I think by keeping in touch with these students who open up to you will really impact their goal to graduation. So, uh, great news out of the 87 students, uh, eight graduated in the summer school program. And the ones that didn't are currently enrolled and are on track to graduate either October or December. So pretty much everyone we met with is on track to graduate or graduated. Um, and this is an example of a tier three uh, intervention or support for some students. Not every single student needs this much intervention, but there are some that need it. And that's, that's what this system of support is set up to do. If they we don't catch them in that first tier, they slip to the second tier, we try to catch them there. And if they don't catch them there, we try to catch them in the third one. So this is a great example of that. And I just wanna say that we worked in collaboration with all of the high schools. Um, they really supported us and helped us with it. We had a team that was available for them and they took advantage of it. And, it, and as you can see, this is a, a huge success story. And I just wanna point out, Elia is one of our child and welfare and attendance clerks. And she was on these kids every day, calling them, making sure they, they were doing what they needed to do. And these are the results, so thank you. Good evening. My name is Jenna Mendez and I'm the district foster parent. Imagine you're in this city. And liaison. <laughs> um, so we're very excited to announce that the All Stars Foster Youth Club and um, Club Hope, our homeless club, have joined forces. So we're gonna be a dynamic duo this year. And so currently we have over 250 students um, enrolled as foster and homeless. And so we are a tier three service, um, but we have further broken down our tiers into the three domains. So academic, social, emotional, and college and career. So because um, myself and Cassandra are overachievers and we love these kiddos, um, we've created a very full yearly plan um, with lots of events and supports for these students in each domain. So for academics, we assist with academic support, specific tutoring and interventions for both groups. Uh, we are very proud that we had 14 out of 15 foster youth graduate last year, which is way above the average um, anyway, and that was in a pandemic with being there not even a couple months. Um, so that's a testament to all the counselors and all their hard work getting them to um, graduate and all the all-star supports we have in place. So we know that connection is really important and is the key. And so social emotional um, events that we have coming up, I send, um, well, I send virtual birthday cards to every all-star student and um, either their guardian or the student. Uh, we do monthly meetings, so all of the counselors meet monthly with these students. And elementary has created a curriculum across the board, so every elementary all-star student is getting the same curriculum um, during that month. And then middle school last year decided to do all their events together, so they did um, a gingerbread a building contest online, they did a calming jar, they had cooking classes, different things to engage these students. And then high school, we have a lot of district-wide events that we provide. Um, and also the counselors are meeting with them, um, meeting those needs. We have some family events coming up. So every grade level this year, Foster and Homeless is gonna get some events. So we have a family art event coming up for elementary. 
we had our kickoff, a summer bonanza, um, where students came into the Parent Center and they got a whole new outfit and shoes and school supplies. We had, um, I think the, there was a dental screening that was going on. We had our You Can Stop people there, um, tobacco prevention, they got lots of snacks and it was really great. Um, we're going to take the middle schoolers to the UCR High Ropes course to work on team building together. We have district celebrations, so we're going to do a bingo night and then a graduation for all 8th grade and seniors this year. The families will get to come and celebrate with them for that. And um, just a lot of different things along the way. For our college and career, we have college visits. We're going to visit uh, Cal State University. We do that not you know when it was pandemic but we're going back to that and then um, Riverside County Office of Education and Norco College have their own college events that we attend for our foster and homeless students and we help them with their college applications and Chafee grants um, I appreciate that this position was even created a couple years ago it has really streamlined the process for um, myself helping with the registrars, the counselors, and the community agencies, so it's so much more efficient. So I can get to those needs right away and we don't have to wait for administrators or you know busy um, schools. And um, so some a story that I wanted to share, a couple things. So our counselors have personally toured um, Eastville Riverside and our Eastville Corona Norco dropping off items that we were um, given. So last year we were giving so many donation, donations from um, our COE and they went to all of these homes and one of the homes that I went to was a Victor's Bauer student and, and their family, there's a couple students in that homes and they were just waiting at the door seeing what I was dropping off and their, their families were so grateful. And um, when I dropped stuff off at the school, they were so grateful that they were part and included because that doesn't always happen. And so we want to make sure that we're including all of our foster and, and homeless students. And then, um, so Roosevelt usually receives money from Circle City Rotary for their, they do a mentor event, a senior event at Silver Lakes and they have, have dinner and do a special event. Well, we couldn't do that because of the pandemic. So Roosevelt decided to all get in the cars, the staff, and um, we went and got the Silver Lakes food anyway toured all over to the students' homes, caravanning, making lots of loud noise in the neighbor neighborhood, and celebrating those seniors um, while they were you know, on their front porch being totally embarrassed, and it was wonderful um, and very exciting. And also, we had community donations for all of our seniors last year, of backpacks of full of over $100 in gift cards and um, lots of goodies. So we celebrated all our seniors, and now we're gonna be doing a huge event at the Parent Center this year. And so Susanna is going to share a story about her middle school connection. So last year, we had an all-star student I desperately tried to connect with. I would reach out to her guardian, who was always so grateful for the opportunities that we were providing. However, her student was just too shy to join our events. Talking to the guardian this year, she was she would state she would sorry she stated how each time an event came up, her student tried to log on, but she just couldn't quite make it happen. When we came back into person learning last year, I was able to introduce myself to my all-star student and make a connection. I think I kind of scared her because I can be a little spastic, but it seemed like it was a good connection. <laughs> I was surprised to hear that during our orientation this year, the student was looking for me. And the first thing she asked me was if we were going to have the same act or say, have activities to do this year and she, if she was going to be a part of them. My heart overflow, overflowed with joy because I had thought I wasn't making an impact to get her connected and involved uh, um, and then realized how excited she is to start this new year looking forward to all the all-star events that we have to come. So with that being said, we don't always know we are making an impact, but we keep trying because who knows when the seeds we plant will blossom. Hello again, last time, I promise. <laughs> okay, how do I work that clicker? Yeah. Okay, so I'm here to talk about um, the intervention counselors, and uh, we are school-based mental health professionals at the high school level that provide tier two and mostly tier three level services. We primarily work with students needing the most support. Students that are referred to us have presenting issues such as trauma, self-harm, suicidal ideation, substance abuse, um, 
diagnosed and undiagnosed mental uh, disorders such as depression, anxiety, PTSD, to name a few, as well as students on alternative placement contracts. And we serve as our on-site foster youth counselors. We work with the students, the families, and school staff to link these identified students to interventions and counseling services both in and outside of the school. We provide small group and individual short-term counseling. Thank you. All right, so rounding out our tier three supports for students. Again, tier three meaning few students, right? We've worked them through the tiers. We're trying to see how we're gonna create success with the students. So in tier three, what we have now is wraparound services. Those are services that are kind of help to get the family involved with other agencies. Perhaps it could be a nighttime phone calls, that kind of stuff. Could be linkages to other mental health. We use Care Solace for much of that. Um, and the other thing that we are going to be bringing on new this year is, she talked about school-based men mental health providers. We are gonna be bringing on some community-based mental health partners. So these are gonna be therapists at our secondary site that will hold a caseload of students there that will be part of those sites and will be able to see some of those students that have more tier three level mental health needs um, for some of the more, um, the more involved cases than what our counselors are currently seeing. Um, so that's why it's very important to have that consistent process across the district so that we we are funneling those services directly to those students who most need it. So uh, as we close here and uh, before we bring up Dr. Tompkins to close us down, we just wanted to show kind of our some of our uh, our pyramid of all of our mental health interventions plus all the extra additional things our counseling team does. It's pretty uh, overwhelming. There's lots of things that we didn't talk about because there's more. Uh, we have more school nurses. We have an anti-bullying program. We have social work interns, uh, but, but we don't have all night. So uh, we just wanted to say that uh, we're really proud of the work and let Dr. Tompkins come up here uh, okay. and, and close us. I'm going to go ahead and speak uh, from my seat here. The, the main purpose uh, of tonight um, was to make sure that these passionate folks behind us uh, had an opportunity to sort of sh share with you important information about the work that they've been doing, the work that we're planning on doing. Um, we are fortunate as a district office team to be able to walk alongside them and support their work. They're the superstars. It's not us. They're easy to support. Um, they want to do great things for our students, and, and it's in our best interest to support that as much as we can. Um, I, I, I love this team, and I'm just so blessed to be um, to be a part of that, but your vision uh, as a board is, is what allowed us to put this plan together regarding some of this funding that came in. And uh, we are looking at ways to sustain. We know there's some things that are gonna be tough to do that with, but it's, it's, in, our, it's in our goal, uh, and we're gonna fight hard to do that. But right now, we wanted to address what our students need now, and we wanna make sure that we can address that uh, as they're back on our campuses uh, full time. Now there's time for questions. I like that you're giving us a calendar. I would have really liked to have been invited to the trauma and informed conference day because the more we know of what our counselors and everybody's doing, the more we could help them. And um, I, I'm very happy that we have a counselor per school We've been asking for that for a few years now. And I think this is gonna be so valuable, especially right now when our students are coming back. Like we keep hearing loss, anxiety, um, panic attacks. It, there's so much more and we truly need these counselors and they have way too much energy today. <laughs> much. But thank you so much for what you do counselors. We truly appreciate everything you do and I know that you are so valuable on our, every campus that you guys are on. Thank you. I also want to echo what Mary said. Thank you so much. I am so excited with the elementary counselors beyond belief because it does start from the bottom and goes up and it's important because they know who you are and so they'll be less comprehensive not to come and see you and that's the big deal because touching every student and I'm sure caseloads are tremendous 
and trying to do this on top of being a guidance counselor you still need to do that however now your your focus is to get him back to par that's what we want him to do and i'm really excited about the uh, sar program turning around the negativity to a positivity so i see a lot of that in all your programs that we're trying to put in place where we're looking positively and, and giving the kid a chance Give them a chance to succeed. And so I appreciate that. I really do. And whatever we can do in, in, in that respect, please let us know. Thank you. Um, great presentation, guys. Uh, I, I think it's important for the remaining audience, but probably more for the folks that might be still watching at home, um, to know that a lot of this isn't new. We're just taking it to a, a different level. Thank you, counselors, for <laughs> nodding your heads, because I, I don't want folks to get the impression that we haven't been doing a lot of this all along. We're just really reining it in and, and, and mainstreaming it, and, and quite frankly, giving you guys um, more carte blanche, if you, if you will. And uh, I am absolutely gonna echo what the, the lady said. Um, you know, we've been wanting um, counselors at every site for quite some time. Um, so just thrilled with that. I, it's just, I think it's a great use of the, the influx of money. And uh, as you said, Dr. Thompson, we don't know what that's going to look like, but it's here uh, and it's, and Mary said it perfectly, now more than than ever um, it, it's something that is needed I, I also I know we touched on a couple of you touched on the summer boost I'd like to and uh, Reggie you and I talked some about this and, and Trish um, uh, I, I'd like because the summer boost was so successful um, we got uh, you guys laid out some numbers um, incredible numbers of students who wouldn't have graduated who caught up on credits I, I, this is the uh, emotional side but the academic side ties into that emotion so you guys are going to do gr have and will continue and going to do great things with this but I, I, I'd like to see us somehow take take this amazingness and take the amazingness of the summer boost and somehow infuse the two so we're so we're not dropping that and i, I know i'm being redundant because i've said that <laughs> multiple times but i've said it because it's been successful so i think if we can take the two concepts infuse them do after school all all the things you guys are going to be doing anyways um let's and I, I love that the teachers are having you in the classrooms and that you're you're getting invited in especially now it, it's just critical so um I, I'm, I'm thrilled with that um the wellness centers there again we have a lot of those already throughout the district and at and at all levels um so uh there again i think it's uh, important for folks to know that and then i i love the i think reggie maybe you said it but uh i, I love it that we're not doing the once and done and that we and appreciate mary once again you i think you said it thanks for the the calendar uh, that we're doing it ongoing because we're, we're going to need it um, and then I'll, I'll end with just this uh, I really appreciate also that we're looking to not only help our students which is, is critical and absolutely important but um, our staff as well uh, because if, if they're not functioning at their highest levels they're not able to do the job that the, they are um, slated to do so uh, very, very comprehensive great job thank you and if I may mr. Pollock just a, a, another quick comment um, one of the other um, uh, pieces we wanted you to see that was the systemic nature of what we're doing and the, and when we look at those tiers you know these assurances within those tiers but there's a process to move from one tier to the next and the fidelity of that of measuring that the fidelity of sticking with that is very important uh, and we're still learning that we don't have that down yet but we're working on it 
um, because we want to make sure um, that we are utilizing every resource that we have. We're efficient, we're comprehensive, and we're coordinated. And that's, those, are, those are the terms that we're using as a group. And, and as you see from the presentation, um, they're on board too. They're, they're leading us. They're leading us um, uh, through this process. That was a, those are that's a that's a great presentation. It's a little long for me, so I, I was taking notes and I stopped taking notes. But I'm just being honest. Yeah, I know, I know. And now I know how my students feel when I lectured from seven to nine thirty. So I know how this. Okay, but anyway, you, you know I'm. Uh, I, I like the last phrase used by Dr. Tompkins. We're working on it. We're working on it. It reminds me of Paulo Freire's word, unfinishedness of our work. We work so hard to do this. And as I was listening, I have my own aunt. <laughs> Not negative, but uh, automatic nice. Not, what's, what's the T? Nice thoughts, because I don't, I don't want to lose our opportunity. You're, you're, you're counselors, you know, you know, I know how sensitive you are to the needs of all kids, regardless of who they are. And so my, my wish, and I, and I hope that I can, I can add, because you, you, we're not here to, to write a letter of recommendation for how good you are, but we are critique to move forward, and I, I think, my issue is the framing. I, th I think if we can think about framing it from tier one to really make sure that it's not one size fits all, maybe, maybe the journey from, from tier one to tier two to tier three will be more wonderful because by tier three, there will be less kids because they have met we have framed it so well that we pay attention to everybody's need in tier one. The tier two, tier three will not count anymore because they're all, we're treating them not one size fits all. The, 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 the other issue that I have is that uh, we look at all schools the same way. Not all schools are the same. We're in the same school district and you're all counselors. You know it, that not all schools are equal. Not all students learn the same way as well. And so as I, as I listen here, when you keep talking about my students, my cling, cling, cling in my head is, what students are we talking about? Who are they? Who are these students? Because not all students learn the same way. And as counselors, you already know in research that now we have EL, we have kids from low income families, and I'm glad you addressed that in tier two with the voices of kids. That, that's really wonderful to hear authentic voices and you have data to show. B but I think that is missing. We, 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 we're not grounded in data from, from tier one. Who are these kids who, you know, who are having problems? Our socioeconomic status low, low from socioeconomic achieving less and in what way? What can we do to help them? What about the English language learners? How are they doing? What's, what does the data say? I'm sure it's, it's, we have the data in the district somewhere. And that's why I, I, you know, I felt good. At, but my impression, of course, as, as a listener from a big presentation is that, whoa, that's one size fits all again. Oh, you know, our students, who are they? Because they all learn different ways. And whether we like it or not, when we look at the achievement gap in this district, it's still there. African American kids, Latino kids, white kids, Asian kids, that's just reality. You cannot avoid it. How can we talk about equity without mentioning that? So what can we do about it? So I, I think you have the power in your hands as counselor to do something about it because you're not only dealing with academics as what John is saying. This is really a combination of social emotional that will really drive the academic work forward. We can all be academic and not take care of the social emotional because they're all different. Some kids are connectivity. I'm, sh I ho I'm, sh I'm glad 
Ben has already taken care of that. We're one-on-one -on -one now. But in, in the beginning, uh, the connectivity is less for those kids who are from low SES. They're having problems. They're not lagging in. And so um, my, my only wish is that, you know, you're aware, no size fits all. Uh, when we talk about robust, what, what do we mean by that? What, what, is, what is the district's vision of learning and success? And how do we measure it? Are we measuring it via smarter balance? Or are we really uh, honest academically and saying, smarter balance is only one measure, but there are other measures. Go to home gardens. Their, their smart balance might be low, but when you talk to their teachers and parents and students, they're, no, they're blossom. We did a little observation there with, my, with some of my students. Boy, what a positive environment we have. And so, it, you know, I, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, happy that this presentation was made because I see the, the big picture that we are. And it, it's, it's a new thing too, the tier one, tier two, tier three. We're doing all of those, but your, your department put it in such a way that you have really identified what the indicators, which I asked many months ago, what tier one, how does tier one look like, tier two and tier three. And, you know, Dr. Goins, I asked Dr. Goins, and I think they, you guys are able to really put it together. I really enjoyed the presentation. And Thank you, Dr. Uh, Lawless. Done. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. I disagree with Dr. Lawless. I could sit here another couple hours and listen to you guys. You guys had so much energy, <laughs> and, and I love it. Um, I don't know who's more excited about having a, a counselor at every school. I don't know if it's us or, or you uh, to see the excitement, but you, you, you all talked about the connectivity, um, the relationships, and, and that's how you do it, um, is to be able to be there. And so um, I, I'm just so thankful you know, for that. And I love the energy. I, I want to see you guys at the end of the year to see if, you, you're <laughs> if that's maintained. Um, and, and, but on that note, too, um, you, know, you talk about being there for the kids, being there for the staff and the teachers. Please make sure you guys practice self-care and, and that you guys have people to take care of you because uh, you, you guys are going to see everything this year. You, you already are starting to see it, um, you know, the, with our students and with our staff loss. Um, so make sure you guys take care of yourselves um, and you guys make sure that they're able to do that. Um, I, I love to hear about the grief counseling. That's that that's so important again, especially this year. And grief comes in different uh, different ways, and so uh, I'm excited to hear about that. And I want to, you know, continue to to hear about that and see how how that's going. Um, I need to learn some of those stress management techniques that you're teaching those kids. Again, I think that the elementary level, you learn those things and, and you practice those, and that's going to be such a benefit. Um, I, like I said, I, I'm not kidding. I need to come to some of those classes and learn some, some stress management techniques. I love the ANTS uh, presentation, and I look at, you know, utilizing that. Um, w one thing, uh, I think, Dr. Goins, you mentioned about the community. Um, either you or, or Trish talked about the, the community mental health providers. and. That's something that's so important to me, the, the access. That's one of my concerns, uh, the access to mental health. I mean, I see it in my private practice all the time when, you know, I, get a, I call a psychiatrist or a psychologist and, oh, I'll see your, your patient in four months. Uh, come on, you know, get real. That's, that, that's eh, eh, and I understand it, but I, but I don't like it. And so that's one of my concerns. And the fact with the tier, tier one, having somebody at every, school i think that that is helping access tier two tier three but my concern is when something is above and beyond um how are we going to access that and and in a timely manner so i'm hoping um th that you could answer some of those questions as as this year progresses um i, I want to see kind of that data on the on the timing when we're able to to have that access from the first call to when a, a student is seeing a, a higher level of care a, a psychiatrist or a um but Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. Uh, just appreciate you guys, and you you are rock stars. So, and Dr. Tompkins and 
Dr. Goyne Trish, the whole team, great job. Mr. Pollock, I, I just want to, I'm not going to, it's already been said, I, th I think your comments have been spot on, all of you. Um, again, I do want to also thank uh, Dr. Uh, Tompkins for his leadership. It's already been said, uh, Dr. Goins, uh, Dr. Illick, uh, Cassandra Willis, um, Mrs. Thompson, uh, Mr. Thomas, who j joined the team recently, but he's, he was here with us, and Mr. Pfeiffer over there, and I don't want, um, pr and also uh, Anita Shirley, who was really part of over the years this work that uh, was presented today. So um, I like that comment about that you said, uh, Mr. Tompkins, about uh, we don't really know what the future holds, but we need to provide these services now. Kind of reminds me of old, I'm going to go back to the 70s. George Allen made it popular, a phrase. He said, the future is now. I really believe that, that we need to address our, our students now. So anyhow, thank you so much, counselors. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it, everyone. Thank you. And again, I, uh, one, one last thought. That, uh, you know, you guys have been doing this for years, and, and uh, um, we've had mental health issues in our society f f for years, and unfortunately, that's, that's getting worse. And then the pandemic has just exacerbated this. So again, you guys are doing a great job, and, and I look forward to seeing how things are going in the future. Mr. Reno, so I did forget John. Sorry, yeah. John. John, thank you so much. That's that uh, the data that you displayed uh, really brought goosebumps of, of our of our students who were not going to be graduating. So thank you, and uh, and Ali and the whole team out there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. Okay, um, we are going to um, move into closed session, and we will be back in a few minutes.
Okay, we are back from closed session, um, and I will report out our actions in closed session. In closed session, by a vote, by unanimous vote, the board took action to approve the appointment of Patricia Sanchez, Director 1, Payroll, Retirement, Business Services. The appointment effective date is to be determined. In closed session, by unanimous vote, the board also took action to approve the following management reclassifications. Aaron Cole to temporary high school assistant principal, Kennedy High School. Michaela Manella to director one, accounting business services. Mark Pfeiffer to coordinator, instructional support. Dana Barron to temporary dean, Kennedy High. The effective date of these reclassifications is August 18th, 2021. Can I get a motion to s and a second to adjourn the meeting? I'll move. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Meeting is now closed at 9-11. Everyone have a good night. Goodbye.